thank you very much for coming to this. Um, I can see lots of uh, old friends, new faces, and it, it really is a delight to, to have you here at the Tapestry Workshop, which has really in lots of ways acted as a home away from home for me for the last 43 years, which is an incredible <laughs> period of time. <laughs> Um, but um, it's a place that, that um, both Sarah and I still feel very attached to and um, it gives us great pleasure to do this. Um, I had a feeling, I made a little speech when I showed my um, uh, Sri Lanka tapestries here and what I said was that often I'm sitting here at gatherings and I'm sure Sarah is too and uh, people talk enthusiastically about the workshop and the new things that are happening. And um, I, somehow I just feel, you know, I've inhabited this building the longest, and so it's Sarah. And we sort of um, have grown up within its walls and maintained contact for all these years. So. I think somebody took might have taken that to heart and suggested that we do this talk. So I hope it'll be informative for you. All right, so this um, first image that I'm showing is, I'm, I'm just going to, to talk initially about how I became involved in art and weaving. And this um, very first slide shows the corner of my parents' sitting room in Colombo, in Sri Lanka, or Ceylon as it was then, and that would have been in the early 50s. And on the wall, you can see a hanging. Um, it's actually a screen print, and you can see that the patch is underneath it. And as a toddler, from the time I was about two, I used to stand on the back of that couch and lose myself in that particular piece of textile art. And later, when I was teaching at RMIT, I found uh, a book that pictured it, that gave me the background of it, and of course I hadn't seen it for many, many years. So, this is... Um, this is the, the actual image that I was looking at and it's the colourway on, on ours was different. It had more black and uh, red and blue in it, so this is a different colourway. But it's a Swedish screen print on linen designed by Stig Lindberg in 1947 and it's called Lustgarden or Lustgarden and it depicts uh, folk tales. So for me, as a child, you can see that there are all the elements of tapestry in that um, particular piece of artwork. Uh, the decorative qualities and the flatness of a medieval uh, design um, and uh, fantasy as well. So it, it, it gave me an absolute thrill to find that because I thought, well, this is where this impulse started at the age of two, you know. So I trained as a graphic designer originally at RMIT and um, I became a book illustrator for a while um, and this is just from one of my one of the history on stage books that I illustrated and I'm showing this particularly because in the left hand corner you've got Penelope weaving at her loom uh, which is a weighted loom with stones uh, waiting for Ulysses to come back from his long voyage. So from the time I was actually a teenager, I was making um, hangings, but there were embroidered hangings. My grandmother and my great aunts used to sew and knit, and I grew up with lots and lots of beautiful coloured embroidery, cottons, threads, um, buttons, stitches, and from the age of about 15 or 16, I started making these, what we call, wall hangings. 
And I was very fortunate that after I finished my course at RMIT, I was offered an exhibition at uh, the New Realities Gallery that was opened by Marianne Bailey. So this is my first exhibition in 1971. And you can see that very cool interior, that Neil Clarahan design, and these very warm tapestries. Embroideries, I should say. At that time, I was also very influenced by a tapestry that was hanging in the National Gallery. And it was called Joie de Brive, uh, and it was designed by um, Donaldson. And um, I think it was the first tapestry that I really had intimate contact with. And I can see when I look at these pieces now how much of an influence that was. Um, Joie de Vivre was woven in 1965 by Tapisserie Portugal. And there were several editions of it. And we were very lucky to have one here in the gallery. And I was very fortunate, too, that um, later on, in my career at the tapestry workshop, I was able to work with John Olson and um, weave two of his tapestries, one that was called Untitled for the Walter and Eliza Institute in 1986 and the other called Rising Sun in 1987. This is just another of my wall hangings and um, there's this I started to incorporate woven sections after I'd learned to weave. So um, it's a bit hard to point out on that screen, but there is a small woven section of a landscape sort of interior to it. And then, of course, the tapestry workshop came along in 1976. And... I'm so delighted that my friend Marie Cook is here. We did graphic design together and um, we were both, well, she more than me, we were just experimenting with bits of weaving, uh, putting up um, warps on frames and uh, made, she actually made things of consequence, I didn't. I just <laughs> made small bits and pieces and cushions and things. But we both became fascinated by weaving. And then all of a sudden this little ad appeared in the paper saying that they were looking for weavers to start a tapestry workshop in Victoria. And she said, hey, I think we ought to apply for this. <laughs> <laughs> so we did. <laughs> and, and subsequently we both became um, foundation weavers of the workshop. So it was a, it was a very good recommendation, Mary. Thank you. So this uh, image is of me working on the very first tapestry that we started here. And uh, Sarah and I will talk a little bit more about the early days, so I won't go into it a lot here. But this was a design by Alan Leach-Jones. And uh, the day the photographer came from New Idea or somewhere like that, I happened to be matching the tapestry. <laughs> Just <laughs> oh, this photo. Um, I decided to put, a, put in um, some uh, examples of work that I did here that I felt were really significant and that had influenced me in my work. Um, and the first one was this, um, which was called West Melbourne, which was commissioned by George Mora for the National Australia Bank. And it was uh, from a print and as you can see, incredibly graphic, incredibly powerful. But what was, what was really interesting about it was that um, attempt to reproduce the print dot pattern, which you'll, you'll see in this, um, through a technique called half passing. And um, Archie Brennan, who was here mentoring us, helped me a great deal to achieve this result. So it's always been quite meaningful to me, this tapestry. So in 1979, I received an Australia Council grant from the Crafts Board of the Australia Council, that's now defunct, it's been defunct for a long time, um, to go to Edinburgh College of Art. 
um, which at that stage was the only art school that had a tapestry department in it. And um, in, that, in that experience, um, uh, I had two great teachers, Fiona Matheson and Maureen Hodge, and there was a great spirit of interpretation. This is just a photo to remind me. This is the grass market in, in um, Edinburgh, which is just behind the Edinburgh College of Art. Um, but the, those two teachers were, uh, they really pushed their students very hard. And what they pushed me away from was perfection. And um, they certainly kind of, uh, opened up my eyes to new possibilities to using texture and tapestry, which I did in this piece. And this was the major piece that I wore while I was there. And um, the, you probably can't see it in great detail. It's all one piece. It was just dropped from two slides, so that's why it looks like two pieces. But it was about 11 feet 6 inches long. And, um, and in it I used textured yarns and knots and things that I use to this day in my work and it was very liberating because you weren't trying to achieve this perfect surface that we that we were trained to to achieve here. Now, on my return I wove these tiny tapestries which were really my first landscapes in a way. There was a exhibition of miniature textiles at the Ararat Gallery. And these are the same size, size as slides. They fit inside slide pockets. And the reason I wore them was that um, in our travels in Europe, my ex-husband was a photographer and he was always taking slides. And I did some drawings. And this sort of alludes to that, that idea of taking the slide in a landscape format and in a portrait format and the sort of difference between the two. But these very tiny little um, tapestries that are still very meaningful to me in the sense that I still pursue landscape as, as subject matter. Okay. <clears throat> you know, th these are in the collection at Ararat. So I came back to the workshop and um, there were a couple of works that, that were really formative in, in my return. And this is one of them. This was um, commissioned by Ivan and Grandma. And it was for their chapel. And they had an enormous brief that talked about all the significance it had to, it had to reflect uh, religion, it had to reflect um, the environment that Ivan and Grandma was in, and it had to appeal to the boys. <laughs> which is, it was a great long brief. And um, Sue Walker, who was our director, um, asked Murray Walker, her husband, and me to look at this, this commission. And Murray had this brilliant idea that if he went up in a plane and took a photograph of Ivanhoe Grandma in the heart of Ivanhoe, that um, that would be a God's eye view. <laughs> <laughs> of, of, the, of the whole environment, which is brilliant, I thought, actually. And when we sold them the idea, we said, look, there's a cross in the middle of it as well. <laughs> and the boys are definitely going to relate to this because this is their immediate environment. And um, over there on the right-hand side, you can see the train station with all the cars parked. And apparently that was where they used to meet the girls. <laughs> so... Um, this was woven by, um, I've got a detail here, this was woven by um, Sam Joyce, who's here today, and Ian Young, <laughs> and me, and we had some jolly old times on it. Um, it that's, that's one wonderful thing about having worked here, that you can remember the experience of weaving with individual people and how close you got, you know, sitting next to each other for four months and knowing what everybody had for dinner and, you know, <laughs> One of the joys. Um, so in, in um, translating this design, uh, we broke it down very much into little abstract 
parts so that when you look at it um, close up, you see these fantastic shapes, you know, which then become meaningful when you see the, the whole uh, idea of it. But um, it, was, it was really fantastic to weave because it was, it was so engaging. And also we did a, a very interesting project for Amset Airlines where we actually wove small tapestries that fitted into the bulkheads. So <laughs> can you imagine Virgin or, you know, uh, Qantas commissioning small tapestries for the bulkheads now? And um, I was lucky enough to weave on these uh, designs by Michael Shannon. <coughs> And um, I immediately sort of felt this great leap of affinity with his drawing and absolutely loved weaving these, you know, the, the, the sort of swiftness of the lines and the texture and, the, um, you know, the sheer joy of the, these, these Tasmanian landscapes from which this is a detail um, that um, really, in fact, I think has, has uh, influenced me later in my, in my weaving life. And after that, Pam and I wove uh, another large tapestry by uh, Michael Shannon called Moonlight. And in this we actually used, uh, we did something no one had ever done before, we used vast quantities of warp as weft to sort of um, really bump up that textural feeling. And also one of my favourite pieces. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> so um, I left the workshop in 1990 and then um, for about 10 years I was uh, doing community projects with schools. So I was a single mother by then and I had two small boys to bring up on my own. And um, the, the I, you know, I always say I feel very blessed because um, the, this opportunity came along to do these tapestries in schools, which I did for 10 years. I could drop them at school, I could work at the school, I could pick them up. And um, it all worked very well for me. But then I returned to study at Monash University in 1998, where I completed a master's and... Um, uh, before that, uh, an honours year, and we were very fortunate at that time because we actually had a tapestry department at Monash that had started, I think, about 10 years earlier. Um, uh, and it was run by Kate Derham, who's no longer with us. Um, and there I just went back to drawing for the very first year I was there, and then I produced the series called Material Bodies, and I'm just showing you a couple of examples of my uh, work for my final exhibition. Um, and the idea of it was how fabric both masked and revealed the human body. And um, I took uh, examples from, uh, from uh, history, and uh, this, this is based on Botticelli's three races, it's the central figure. And for each tapestry there was a charcoal drawing. So this is called Revealing Grace. And these are almost life-size, so they're very big works. And um, this one is from a reconfigured painting by Guido Reni, which is one of the most beautiful um, Baroque paintings you could see. There's, I think there's one in Italy and there's one in the Prado in, in Spain, and um, it tells the story of Atalanta and Hippomenes. So uh, I reconfigured it and wove the tapestry so that the cloth actually became the subject matter and moved right into the centre focus, and it's called Embracing Atalanta. So just when I was finishing my master's, um, degree, I got an invitation of, of a residency at Bundanon, which most of you will know is Arthur Boyd's beautiful estate on the Shoalhaven River where they have uh, a program that runs um, 12 months of the year with about four or five visiting artists. 
And I was determined that I wasn't going to do what I had been doing before, but that I was going to use the environment to to make tapestries that that um, reflected the place I was in. And uh, the last tapestry that I wove here happened to be uh, from a painting by Arthur Boyd. Um, and um, I had a bag of wool, which was the unwindings of all the, from the tapestry, which I took with me. And um, as the story goes, I sat there on the first day with my back against a rock in a small picture frame, walked up and produced my very first en plein air tapestry, which is the small one to the left there. And I was so thrilled that I could actually weave something complete in a whole day that it became a way of working. And um, it led to an exhibition along with the drawings that I did there, and uh, which was called A Month at Bandanon because I did receive a second residency. And my dear friend Alison French is here today, curated A Month at Bandanon that, that was exhibited um, twice in Melbourne and then at the Drill Gallery in Canberra. I just put that detail of a larger tapestry in because there was a there is a sort of relationship to the Michael Shannons um, in the swiftness of the lines, the use of half passing if you're a weaver, um, and the sort of intensity of colour as well. Um, I was able I've been able to do these uh, tapestries all around the world. And I did it for 10 years, and um, I'm weaving there in Sri Lanka on the left and in France on the right. And these are some of the little en plein air tapestries that I produced uh, in Sri Lanka, France, and here in um, Victoria in Marksfield. Um, I, I started teaching at um, RMIT in 2000 and I taught uh, life drawing and uh, tapestry weaving and uh, general drawing course. And then um, somewhere around 2006, I think it was, or 2007, I did a print workshop. And as part of this print workshop, um, we started by um, writing an essay about landscape and then making these monotypes and they actually started me on the next phase of the work that I've been doing ever since. To my great surprise, when I wrote the essay, it was half about Sri Lanka and half about Australia. And then I noticed that the prints I was making kind of reflected the two colours and there was a sort of high horizon line there. And so that's really sort of influenced the work that I've done. And this was before I went back to Sri Lanka in 2009. Um, and uh, so this started what's called the, the Two Lands series. Uh, these two tapestries are in the collection of De Deccan University now. And then this one called A Trio of New Horizons, also very much based on those monotype prints in the lovely sort of accidental uh, little blobs and, and um, almost um, random marks that, that happen when you're, when you're making a print but also relate so well to tapestry. Um, and this one is called uh, 24 Avocations of the Wet Dry Landscape and in this one I combined um, the Australian landscape and the Sri Lankan landscape in a more literal sort of way. And um, it was uh, picked up and toured in the first Tamworth Triennale, uh, which was very exciting because it went all around to, to various regional galleries. And this is getting to be recent. Uh, there's a series called Transitions. Uh, two of the smaller ones of which uh, were exhibited this year in Colombo Scope, which is a big international arts festival in Colombo. 
Um, and once again, that, that whole idea of moving through landscape from one country to another to find a new place to live and, and, um, and uh, just that, that the, the, the vertical movement which actually um, uh, correlates to weaving a tapestry because you weave from the, the bottom to the top. So um, I'll just show you quickly a couple of uh, my most recent works. Some of you might have seen them in the preview here. I've just had my first exhibition in Sri Lanka after leaving there 57 years ago, <laughs> which was very exciting. And these are just a few of the images. This is, um, for those of you who have been there, this is the Yala Sanctuary, which is down south, which is a, a, a natural wildlife park. Um, the one on the left is a garden at Willigama. The one on the right is um, a very mystical place called Kaludia Popuna uh, that not many tourists get to, but um, it's just, it has a, an amazing sort of atmosphere, which I hope I've conveyed in that tapestry. And this one, which is, you know, very typical of Sri Lanka, the, the paddy in the hills, the paddy fields and the hills. So I think that's probably all that I'm going to say, and I hope I haven't run too far over the time. Um, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you also, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, uh, it's a lot to tell you in 15 minutes, <laughs> 40 years of life. So I'm hoping that the um, PowerPoint that I've put together for a sketchbook will in many ways tell its own story. Um, I grew up in England and uh, visited um, many stately homes and saw many hideous tapestries <laughs> um, over the years of which none had any impact on me. So I did play with no interest in tapestry at an early age. Um, but I did, I was a linguist and um, I was a um, I got admonished to do languages, but actually says, hey, actually, I'm not going, I'm going back to England. And I started, I travelled and grew up as a young hippie in, um, in the UK and in Spain and Morocco uh, in the early 70s and came back to Australia and um, was guided by a wonderful surgeon, actually, who was a friend of the family and suggested that maybe going to RMIT might be good idea and maybe because I've always made clothing, um, I was a real maker, I uh, had no claim to be a um, wonderful um, drawer like um, Rasid or um, Kay Lawrence or many of you here, but it was something that I, um, I learned how to do and, and ended up becoming very, very interested in drawing, sorry, becoming very interested in drawing and fundamentally believe uh, that weaving is drawing, and you'll see that, as it um, is uh, reflected through the slides that I show you. So I went um, to RMIT and um, came back adorned in patchwork boots and flowing capes from Morocco and uh, created a bit of a stir, I'm told, but I was far <laughs> too shy to be aware of it. Um, and at the end of my third year, um, during which time I'd thrown paint at fabric on the washing line, I'd crocheted scarves, I'd crocheted hats, I'd made shoes, I'd spun and woven. I had actually found a whole lot of drawings last night, but by the time I put this PowerPoint together, I thought, no, no, I can't even <laughs> do anymore. So maybe another talk, you'll see some of those drawings. Um, but I had this uh, a, a teacher um, who taught us fashion illustration. And um, I also had a, another wonderful uh, teacher called Leonard Legg, who ended up becoming my sort of de facto father-in-law further down the track, 
who was just very um, encouraging of my sort of experimental nature and always used to say the lilies of the field. So I reflected this sort of very low-key, quiet persona, but I was busy, busy, busy working away and very, very excited about the possibilities of how you could use textile not so much as fashion, but just uh, textile as, as a medium and um, in the many different ways that it could be used. So I learned batik from some amazing uh, young people who had been living in Japan and Indonesia, and I got a job sewing for them uh, as part of my one of my ways of earning money during the holidays. And in this photo, you can see me adorned <laughs> these batik clothing. So what actually happened was Jenny Denise, who was my fashion teacher at the end of my third year, said. I've been invited to give this uh, class at this summer school in Adelaide. And uh, there's something called off loom weaving. And I think you might really like it. Why don't you come along as my assistant? And, um, and I've booked you into the class and you can go do the class. And when I got to the class, um, she said, oh, no, 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 just go off and have a good time. And I'll, I'll be fine. I, I can manage. So... Um, I'm to you all now, of course. That class was run by Sue Walker. Oh. And at that stage, she was known for her three-dimensional um, sculptures. There's a wonderful piece in the Ararat collection, which is um, a wooden, beautiful sort of um, wooden shelf with uh, horsehair, crocheted cups and, and saucers. So we set to with all these bits of old yarn and hessian and rope, and I had a wonderful time. <laughs> and not only that, but I, I suddenly had this sort of dawning that I'm in amongst a group of people that I feel part of. So it wasn't just a textile course, but there was ceramics and... Kay might help me fill in whatever else there was, but I felt that I was very comfortable where I was. I wasn't comfortable with the idea that I would um, be a fashion designer at Flinders Lane, which my two best friends were, and they were designing safari suits and I don't know what else, but I wasn't doing that. Um, and I put a couple of images up because this was very much sort of the zeitgeist of the time. After um, my first uh, experience at Tatachilla, I actually went and did, as many of us did, a teaching diploma because I didn't really know quite what I wanted to do. And I went to the State College and I wrote my own, my own program, which you could do then. I don't know that I learned anything about the theory of teaching, but I had the most wonderful time. And I did every, just about every um, studio workshop that I could do, which was painting, sculpture, ceramics. And then two days a week I taught at uh, community schools throughout the year. And I took students home to my house to do batik in the back garden. Imagine being able to do that now. But it was the most wonderful year. And the State College had an extraordinary library. And it was in that library that I discovered this um, sort of seminal book, Beyond Craft the Art Fabric, and discovered artists like Magdalena Abakanovitz, Olga Damaral, um, Sheila Hicks, uh, Lino Tony, and, um, sorry, I'll just move on. So, and I'm not sure, it was about the same year that the Tapestry Workshop set up, there was an extraordinary exhibition of Magdalena Abakanovitz's work at the National Gallery of Victoria. <laughs> Leon is going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can still remember walking into that space and um, remembering the power of it. It was just it was quite... Life, it was life-changing. It was life-changing, wasn't it? It was quite extraordinary. Um, but having said, said that, there was also a bit of division within the community about whether um, it was valid to be making these material-based sculptures or whether tapestry weaving as a pictorial uh, medium with its relationship to image making and painting was the way to go. Just move on. So this is Olga Damaral and this is a work of hers that's in the Ararat Craft Collection, or Ararat Gallery Collection, I think it was 
one of their very first works that they acquired in 1974, and this was on show last year, and I had a work that they've also acquired that um, was hung directly next to this work. So life is amazing how, you know, I always feel like you sort of, it's a bit like you, um, a piece of thread where you go along and you make a loop and you sort of, the Rolling Stone thing, gathering moss and you go along and then you gather more moss and um, that was a, an amazing moment for me where I sort of, my work was next to the wonderful Olga de Morel. Um, so here we are, I went back to Tatatilla a couple of years later um, and did tapestry weaving with Belinda Ramson and Belinda had studied, um, we'll talk, a, probably Christine and I'll talk a little bit more about this so I don't want to talk too much, I've got a lot of slides to get through, but um, I'd already been at Melbourne State College, uh, Melbourne State College and I uh, wrote into my program that I'd do an, uh, a day a week at the Melbourne College of Textiles so I did loom weaving and some tapestry and discovered that I really loved weaving and somehow it pulled everything together um, of, of process and material and method. It, it suited me, it suited my body, it suited my mind, the pace suited me. And then I went along and did this workshop with Belinda and I absolutely loved it and um, it was an extraordinary experience to be in South Australia at that time and learning from her. Um, and so in the same year, uh, there was a call that went out, as Chris had said, for people interested in the workshop. And I remember writing to, I think it was maybe it was the Premier or someone just voicing the expression of interest. And then later on, I was chosen to take part in this amazing training selection workshop. And as a result of that, um, I... Uh, I was given a job and I felt that I'd landed in heaven really. I was teaching um, in a high school um, in my hippie clothing, <laughs> um, amazed how I got through the day really. But I mean I love teaching and I've always taught and I continue to teach um, but it's hard to imagine how I would have survived in the, the, the tough it, um, life as you know, a teacher in the education department. I was far too soft and gentle. I would have gone back, I think, with a very strict set of rules on my second year. But anyway, I didn't go back. I um, joined the tapestry workshop. And the next few slides that we'd like to proceed are really um, just to give you some idea of uh, the relationships I established with artists along the way. And I think for me, apart from obviously the... the the relationships we, we um, as weavers formed with each other, which are incredibly rich and still are incredibly rich for many of us that have been maintained over all this period. Um, for me, I hadn't lived a life alongside uh, artists. My, my parents were medical. Um, I probably had an art who spun, but I hadn't lived um, a life with artists. So... And I'm not even sure how sure Sue Walker was about whether I'd be the right person for the, for the workshop um, with the background I had. But I learned very fast and um, I became, I mean, I think I was very good at my job because I was fascinated in the artists that I worked with, which is also why I think often it's very hard to do your own work when you're a weaver here because you can become so absorbed in the vision of the artists that you're working with that sometimes it's hard to separate yourself out. Um, but one of the most important artists I worked with was um, Guy Stewart and I worked with him um, on two tapestries. And I think for me, again, the most important thing, apart from that, he's an incredibly nice person and he'd spent a lot of time in Japan, so I learned a lot from that. Um, the emphasis on drawing is, was paramount in his practice. Um, this is one of the, I think, the first major tapestry that I was in charge of, but I worked with Ian um, Young, and, um, which was a great pleasure, one of the very few men who worked at the, the workshop, wonderful sense of humour and an absolutely brilliant weaver. But one of the interesting things was at that stage we didn't have a loom that had um, a rolling warp. 
So we built, under I think the guidance of Archie Brennan, this extraordinary box structure and wove this tapestry for the RACV building in um, Springvale, I think it was, um, based on a John Coburn design. Uh, like Chrissy, I then um, left Australia for a while and I, um, by this time I'd become very interested in Japan. My, my brother had studied Japanese at university. I became very interested in the kimono um, as a, an artistic expression and um, through a series of um, events I ended up going and maybe the first one was that I saw um, uh, scholarships for, or I think maybe it was just airfares from the Australia Japan Foundation. You could apply to go. So I got one of, the, I got the airfare, and then you had to have a project. And uh, one day Sue Walker said, "Oh, there's this man coming from Japan, um, and he wants to have a look at the workshop. And um, he runs a school in Japan, but he's coming on Sunday." And I can't come. Is there anybody here that would like to greet him? So, of course, my hand went up straight away. Anyway, the man turned out to be this extraordinary, extraordinary man, um, uh, Tekishi Kinoshita. And uh, he said, well, I have this school and we can organize a special program for you. Just, you know, apply. And... Um, so I was able then to write to the Australia Council <laughs> because we had no money. We didn't get paid very much here. Um, and uh, so I ended up getting the Australia Council um, funding for my um, school, for the fees, and I did a bit of a living class. And I went to Japan for six months, and I studied at school for three months, and I traveled around Japan for another three months, um, right down to the island south of Okinawa, looking at areas that were still practicing um, Kasuri, or many of you will know Kasuri is ICAT, which is the Indonesian um, method of weaving. And it was really the most um, incredibly important time in my life and very formative uh, for how I then looked at art and made art from then onwards. So on the right-hand side is this um, silk kimono cloth, which is 11 and a half metres long, and I'm not sure, I think it's 32 centimetres wide, and that's a centimetre long, uh, wider than they're normal because I'm a very wide person, and you have to fit four lengths across um, to make the kimono, so they added an extra centimetre, so that the sleeves didn't end up here, but close to there. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about Japan further on except to say that I've been back many, many times and I, particularly in the last few years, um, I go back every year or every two years and I'm going back again in September for a, a, a couple of months. Uh, the next major project I was in charge of was the Richard Larter for um, the National Gallery. Uh, it's a, a project that I remember very fondly, particularly for the team that I worked with. And um, again, I look back and I think it was so formative in terms of the, my, the, my own work. So I really often joke and say I make lines, I make circles and stripes. I you know, could put all sorts of art speak attached to, <laughs> to my work, but in the end I'm very interested in circles and stripes, particularly stripes. And, um, but this was a terrific work uh, to work on and also I think I worked on about three or four latters and I always chose to weave Pat Latter's face because I found it so expressive. And um, Pam and I were just talking about, she's just finished, and Chris, um, the portrait of the judge. And I remember the first time that I met Pat Latter and I could barely take my hands off her her face because I felt that I'd woven those cheekbones and that amazing gap in her teeth so many times and she was a really extraordinary person. Uh, this was, um, I think, uh, you, ca you can't underestimate how important the Australian, the, the Indigenous work that has been woven by the Tapestry Workshop is. Um, this, I don't know if it's still called the NC collection, but there is a really extraordinary collection that I hope at some point could
could be gathered together and shown. Um, it certainly had a huge impact on my life because, I mean, I, I, I don't want to make any assumptions, but I don't know if there's anybody here tonight with Indigenous heritage, but it certainly um, has been an enormous privilege for me to have both worked on Indigenous tapestries and um, project managed a lot of tapestries with Indigenous um, artists, and it's been extraordinarily uh, humbling and rewarding and a big part of my life at the Tapestry Workshop. Um, this is another uh, significant work uh, for me that I worked on relatively shortly after coming back from Japan. And I feel that maybe if I'd approached it before that uh, trip, I might have um, put a lot more detail in. But I feel by then I'd learned to be a lot more selective about it. And I think this is a, a huge issue when you're weaving, that you have these complex images and just how much information you pull out that then gets woven and then makes a successful weaving. And again, this was a terrific uh, project that I worked on with Leone for the first time. And many people say, oh, um, oh, you're so quiet and all weavers, I'm not quiet anymore, I was when I was young. Um, you must be so patient. And, um, and I say, well, we're a very diverse group and you should get to meet Leone. We're completely different. She's so outspoken and so out there. And I'm so glad she's here today. Um, and we will get on really, really well and really respect, really respect um, the diversity. Uh, you wouldn't say that about music musicians or painters, but it's said a lot, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, this is a terrific um, uh, work to work on. And uh, I'm not sure where it is now. It was hung in the Port of Melbourne Authority. At one point it was found under a bridge in um, Ballarat, I think and cleaned. I'm not sure where it was now, but it was a terrific project. And I think possibly one of the first where uh, we did quite complex uh, draw, uh, draw, um, three-dimensional draw, drawing. So I actually wove that whole um, hail, uh, wool bale section. So that was quite challenging for me. And um, for someone who hadn't grown up drawing, I felt that I sort of handled it pretty well. I did very well in drawing it out. Uh, this is another very important um, project was for me. And um, it was the last major work that I worked on um, as part of the weaving team, I think. Uh, I wove it while I was pregnant with my daughter Anoni, who's here tonight. And I wove it whilst... Uh, also training a large number of people to work on the Arthur Boyd tapestry, um, which Leone was then in charge of. Uh, it was an enormous privilege to work with Helen Maudsley. It was a tapestry that was commissioned by um, a private client for his home. It was very, very complex. Um, and I remember Sue saying to me all the time, can't you reduce the palette? It's taking a long time. And I'd say, oh, but then you wouldn't get subtlety. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure that we quite we came in on budget. But nevertheless, I trained a lot of really good people and it was ended up being a very beautiful tapestry. Uh, so now I'm going to make um, the shift because what happened then was I left and I had um, an Oni and took a year's leave and then I came back, and I think maybe I did. Um, I did actually uh, weave a, a tapestry. But then um, Sue spoke to me and said that she really felt that she couldn't uh, continue managing the floor and uh, getting the commissions in. And I think by this time it was getting a bit tougher. But we'll talk a bit more about that. And um, would I take on a new role of um, studio manager? So I actually did that for two years. And I got very used to going out into the world and um, talking to artists. And um, I did love it. And I think at that stage also I'd been at the workshop for about 14 years. And I'd never seen another job, really, that uh, had interested me. 
But when Noni was a baby, I went down to visit my brother who was living in Tasmania for a short time. And I went to visit the art school there. They had the most, ex um, because a friend of mine was teaching the painting department, and they had the most amazing um, weaving textile department. And I thought, ooh, this is pretty amazing. Anyway, uh, they then advertised for someone to run the department. So I applied. I got the job. I jumped off the high diving board with my daughter. And um, I moved to Tasmania and I lived and worked there in various capacities for almost 10 years. And part of the requirement, of course, of teaching in the art school was that you had your own practice. So after many years of making bits and pieces and exhibiting bits and pieces after work and at the weekend, I had to very seriously take on board that I was an artist and work out whether I had anything to say. So I put this... Um, slide up because it was one of the first tapestries that I saw that actually spoke to me as a young person and thought, well, maybe tapestry is relevant to me. So if you think in 1970, I actually made this in 1973, I was still at art school studying fashion design and becoming more and more interested in textiles and, and cloth. Um, so I ended up making a lot of work in Tasmania and um, this is a bit, you know, I went there in 1991 and I uh, had a huge house and a lot of space to work and not so many distractions as you do in the big city. And I ended up making a huge body of work um, called The Roundedness of Return. And I don't know that I could do it now because we're in such a different climate with um, uh, refugees, but I was very interested in the idea of uh, migration and what it meant to people. So, I, in effect, I migrated to Australia when I was 15, and um, even though I was coming from England to Australia, it was a huge sense of dislocation. And then I migrated, if you like, to Tasmania when I was 40, which was the same age that my mother was when we came to Australia. And I had uh, a gingham dress when I was a child, and I found a gingham dress for um, my daughter and Noni in, in Hobart. And I went on to make a huge body of work about this gingham dress, um, and I couched it in a discussion about, my, my great, about migration. Um, so this work was uh, shown in various capacities, um, both in Australia and um, in Europe, and ended up being acquired by the National Gallery of Victoria, but I don't know that it's ever been on display. Uh, this was another work that I made later after receiving Australian Council residency in Pesozzo in um, Italy, and I made a study of Renaissance fabrics, which are the fabrics that have the very huge motifs. And it was a, um, a, work, it's a work called The Evening Dress, and it was based on a photograph of my parents at um, a ball in Oxford um, just before they were married. So the um, fabric, if you like, on the left-hand side is um, a digital print based on my mother's dress, and um, the image on the right, and the tapestry is made just after my father had died, has a, a sort of tool pattern, so it evokes his um, evening suit. Um, and then, um, so I'm skipping along quite quickly now because I'm sure we're getting time's getting a bit tired. Uh, I returned to Melbourne partly because Sue Walker offered me a job to um, project manage the Federation Tapestry Series uh, project, and that became evident very quickly that I can't, couldn't do it on a part time basis. So I sort of um, moved away from that and became education officer for a year. But uh, I had already started a master's degree at RMIT and I was absolutely determined to complete that. So I worked three days a week on my master's and or the other way around, three days a week, paid, paid work. And I did my master's over um, a period of four years and it was called Positioning the Stripe. And I wanted to couch it a little bit in personal experience but I didn't want to be quite as... Um, 
what's the word, but I didn't want to focus too much on myself within a, an academic um, investigation. So this was one of the most, uh, the largest pieces I did, and I've also been working in Gingham for, for about 10 years, so I wanted to do something different. And um, this is a work that was acquired by the National Gallery of Australia, and uh, it's in their collection. Again, I don't think it's been shown very mm. Uh, I had um, many exhibitions, um, and one of my favourite actually was this exhibition at the City Library, because I felt it was an exhibition that was really viewed. You'd go in there at a, at a library at 8 o'clock in the morning, and the gallery is packed um, with young people um, having their breakfast, reading the papers. You'd go in there at 9 o'clock at night, and it was still packed. And um, a lot of my work, um, particularly the Gingham work, related to text, so it seemed a very um, a relevant place to be showing you. Uh, I continued uh, with drawing and I made a large series of uh, drawing, striped drawings as part of my masters and continued to work on them. And that led into uh, this work where I was asked to make a work for a Tamworth, I think it was by Neil then, called A Matter of Time. And I decided to make a work about my mother's life and she uh, was a colonial child, and Chris Eden and I have so many, we crossed so many paths together, um, or separately, but they crossed the different periods. My mother grew up in Sri Lanka. Uh, she was born in Ceylon um, as a colonial child, and her father was a tea planter. So this uh, work, Cinnamon Roses, um, documented her life in abstract form. I'll keep ripping through the next few because I know time's getting tired. Uh, I had a big survey show that toured um, uh, well, was, uh, Victoria and Tasmania, which represented the Gingham works and these um, Sri Lankan works uh, from 97 to 2006. I went to Sri Lanka for the first time in 2005, just after the tsunami, and had uh, the most extraordinary experience of going up to this um, little church high in the high country where my mother had been christened, my grandparents had been born, uh, various relatives were buried, and no one will vouch for the fact that I just burst into floods and floods and floods of tears because I had no sense of that. I had no sense of that connection in Australia at all. So it was um, an amazing experience. And I have been back to Sri Lanka many, many times. I actually went often when I was working here um, to an Ayurvedic centre, meditation centre. Um, but I also um, made very strong connections with a textile company there, Barefoot, and would cite many of their designers as very good friends of mine that I stay with and I visit whenever I return. Uh, this is another one of the... Um, Sri Lankan works, as I moved away from the family story, I became more, more interested in the history of trade. And um, I made some works called Cargo, and this is using cinnamon sticks that were 1.2 metres long, so it's really a drawing installation. This large work, Cargo, um, has toured nationally, but not internationally. Um, customs have a lot of difficulty with them. Um, with um, cinema sticks, I'd actually like to take it to Portugal, but um, maybe I have to make the cinema stick work there. So we're nearly at the end. Of, I've just sort of kept working on my own work. I don't do large work so much anymore. I have um, my I don't have such a great back anymore, so I can't really sit for long periods. But I do a lot of drawing and mixed media work. Um, so these are a series of drawings I did. Sri Lanka using little rubber bands and silk. And um, how are we going for time? Because I might have to yeah, yeah, might have um, just whiz through. This is, uh, I went back and I taught at Monash for a while, um, which was a wonderful experience. Uh, I then came back to the Tapestry Workshop as production manager. And this, these two images really here are just to reinforce the importance of the work we did we did and still do with Indigenous artists. I still say we. It's almost impossible to drop that pronoun, even though I don't officially work here. Anymore. 
Um, and these are just some of the works that I was particularly proud of being associated with. Uh, David Noonan wasn't here when we um, organised this project and I'd be emailing him and phoning him late, late at night. Uh, it's one of my favourite tapestries ever, I think. Uh, the Sally Smart, uh, again, a really wonderful tapestry, wonderful artist uh, to work with. Uh, so just to, to flush out that it's not just the finished product, it's, the, as you all know, it's the life here and the people you work with and the relationships you build up. Um, the last two or three slides is just to say that, yes, I've kept on making work in a small way, but the most significant project that I have been involved in over the last six years, and it is six years, is working with a group of refugee women from Myanmar. And I first taught them here at the Tapestry Workshop uh, through funding that was sourced through the Tapestry Workshop and Multicultural Arts Victoria. And um, we did six weeks, and then there were a couple of uh, the Karen women who just wanted to keep going. Um, by then, my job here had ended. I had a lot more time, and I just started going to their homes. And six years later, we still so close, and it's such a rich part of my life. And I visited them last week with a large sum of money made from tapestries that have been sold at various um, places, including the boroughs in um, Brunswick. And um, I'm currently putting together a show for Wangaranga Art Gallery that opens on May the 25th of their major works that I'm borrowing back and some collages. Uh, so keep on turn for that. Um, these are examples of some of their larger works, which are at one day, I don't know how the side, but 1.2 high by 80 centimetres wide. They work straight on the loom. Uh, I never know what I'm going to find. Uh, unlike my quite cerebral, refined, tight work, theirs is just wild and expressive and they're just the most extraordinary people. And this is just the last little bit of story to tell. So in... Um, November of last year, Noni, my daughter Noni and I went to Europe and we went uh, to the UK and uh, uh, that was initiated by what you'd see, the Frida Kahlo show at the um, v &A and the Annie Elbers show at the Tate Modern. And we went also to Portugal because I'd been there in Lisbon about four years ago and I really loved it. And we had three weeks there and then went back to England and saw so many wonderful exhibitions. Um, I had Christmas with my brother, met up with Alf Law, who was one of the many wonderful artists and residents that we've had here. I spent a lot of time with him and his family. And um, shortly before we were due to come back, I said to Noni, um, I don't think I'm going to come home with you. Um, and Alf and I put her on the plane, much to her disgust, <laughs> on uh, New Zealand. And I stayed on that extra week in um, London with my family and then went back to Portugal for a month. And at the end of my street, um, I'd already, Noni and I had already found this, but there was this, um, there is this amazing organisation that was set up by a young woman who's an industrial designer who had studied graphic design and product design, and a, a young uh, psychologist. And it was set up to provide a safe, uh, warm, inviting space for elderly people, disenfranchised people, uh, to come and work with it uh, together um, to provide uh, help and support to them, um, social support, and with a very strong textile base. So I just popped in and said, hi, I'm a tapestry weaver. Is there anything I can do to be um, to help? Can I teach some tapestry weaving? And um, they welcomed me in and um, I taught some tapestry and I taught some various other things and I went two or three days a week. And I've never had so many hugs and kisses and warmth um, shown to me in my whole life. It was just extraordinary. And there, um, uh, Susanna, who's in the top, Pink corner, having bought and bought and cake, 
weavers for okay, for the birthday, one of the 80th uh, birthday parties, uh, goes often to the Azores Islands. And she said, oh, well, next time you go, you have to go because I work with a weaver there. And also we're inheriting a whole lot of looms from a school that's um, uh, closing down. So the plan is that I'm going to go back um, first to Japan in September for two months. Because you can when you're nearly 70. And um, to uh, back to Portugal for four or five months and help them with these things and just generally be part of the organisation. So uh, I feel very, very lucky. Um, and this is just to really end with, you know, any elbows that we take. I mean, just so fantastic that finally, uh, you know, um, weaving is being em em embraced in such a wonderful way. And not only was the um, the Annie Elba show, but um, they had a, a show that was concurrent just for a short time about um, that focused on materiality. And they had this wonderful room, which is what Noni and I went to first before we even hit the Annie Elba's, um, with uh, Olga Damara work, Magdalena Epikanovic's extraordinary Lenore Tawny work, so, um, you know, I've just come back even more invigorated about the wonders of the woven, the, the medium of weaving and what can be done with it. So, thank you. But I thought I'd begin by asking Chrissy, because she's much more articulate than me, to give, um, to give you a bit of background, for those of you who don't know, to how the workshop was set up and the sort of climate of the time. Yes, well, I think uh, we were extremely fortunate, and I have to say that to begin with. Um, Sarah and I spoke the other day, and, and we are just so grateful that we were in the right place at the right time. Um, and that the, the zeitgeist of, of um, what was happening in the art world and what was happening with funding was so extraordinary in the early to mid-1970s. So, um, how the workshop came into being, there's a sort of um, a story that's trotted out all the time that it was actually Lady Delicum, who was the governor of the, uh, sorry, the wife of the governor of Victoria, who saw uh, a magnificent exhibition of tapestries here. And of course we were also aware that um, Australian artists like John Coburn and John Olson and Leonard French were going overseas to have their tapestries woven in France and Portugal. And she said, in a country of fine weavers and fine wool, fine painters and fine wool, this is the natural place for a tapestry workshop. And she actually wrote to the government and um, lobbied them until they took it seriously. Um, so the, the Hamer government, um, they commissioned a feasibility study and they sent a gentleman by the name of John Blanche overseas to um, look at all the workshops. And um, by this stage, um, people like Dame Elizabeth had got involved um, and were, were backing this idea. Um, so when I talk about funding um, the, and the zeitgeist of the 1970s, the very first Ministry for the Arts was set up in 1973 by Mr Hamer and he made himself the Minister for the Arts. So already you had this wonderfully strong, well, this person in a, in a very strong position of power who was determined to expand the arts here. Also in the early 70s, the Crafts Councils were established right around Australia, and also the Crafts Board of the Australia Council. So all of a sudden, this craft was being taken seriously as an art form and, and something that was valuable to the community. And... Um, Things like the new NGV were being built, were being built, 
So there was a huge boom in, in sort of recognition of the arts and wanting, Australia wanting to be part of it. Do you want to add anything to that, Sarah? Except to just um, the only thing I would add to that is that uh, I did visit here, here on this. Um, which is just a little aside. I did visit the uh, manager of uh, the Porta Lake, the Portuguese tapestry workshop in um, in Lisbon, and she was so um, warm and welcoming because she said that they had loved working with the Australian artists so much. Mm. So obviously that then stopped, but um, <laughs> she, she wasn't bitter and twisted about that. Yeah, so there was this very strong sense of belief that this this could happen. Um, and so, um, you know, um, John Blanche, interestingly enough, met Archie Brennan. It was the first tapestry workshop he went to in Edinburgh. And he was very impressed by the man, Archie Brennan, because he was such an accomplished weaver. He'd been the director of the Dovecot Studios there for 10 years. And he was full of ideas, which, of course, was very different from um, the artisan-based workshops in the rest of Europe, where you just had weavers who were copying paintings. Um, so uh, it was very... Um, he had a lot of foresight in recommending that, that Archie Brennan be an advisor to the setting up of this workshop. And then by, a, a, by great good luck, uh, Belinda Ramson, who was married to um, a Canberra academic, had been in uh, Edinburgh. Uh, she'd learned to weave there and she had spent a year working at the Dovecot Studios. So she was virtually on hand to train the, the potential weavers for the workshop. So Sue Walker who was appointed the first director. Um, she had got involved. She was working at the, the State College at that stage teaching. And uh, she, when she heard about the workshop, she had got involved and put forward a few ideas. And she, with I think a woman called Elizabeth Hill, were both sort of determined that the workshop should be um, a different place to the workshops that existed in Europe. So uh, Archie was brought in as an advisor and uh, I was very taken with this line where he, he, he said that what we needed to create as the core of the workshop was a climate of possibilities rather than following the, the traditional workshop model, that the people to be employed needn't necessarily be skilled artisan weavers, that it was important to employ people with a range of art school training in other disciplines because, of course, we had no uh, nobody taught tapestry or even embroidery at... Um, at, at art school here at that stage. And so they looked for people who had an acute visual sense. Um, and also the philosophy of the workshop was established early on, uh, also under Archie's advice, um, that we work with artists in a spirit of collaboration rather than copying uh, designs that were supplied. And living artists, yes, which by and large has been adhered to in the last 43 years, which is very important. Um, so uh, once all that was established and a building was found, it all happened very quickly, you know, within, within a couple of years that this building was found and that they put the, the ad in the paper that I referred to before. <laughs> And um, Belinda Ramson uh, trained us over a period of two mo months every second weekend. There were, out of 150 applicants, 12 people were chosen to do the training course. And um, out of hmm? a very long job application, <laughs> yes. And um, 
And out of the 12, five of us were chosen to start the workshop. So I want to read you this very quickly. <laughs> Which is very funny in hindsight. And it's my letter of employment from Sue Walker. 2nd of June, 1976. Dear Chris Cedar, I'm happy to offer you a position as weaver in the Victoria Tapestry Workshop on a casual basis at this stage. Payment for casual weavers will be at an hourly rate of $5 and there would not be annual leave or sick leave entitlements. No doubt you will be interested to know that Meryl Dumbrell has been offered the position of senior weaver on a full-time basis and Mari Cook and Sarah Lindsay have been offered positions as weavers for three days a week. Meryl will be starting to work for the workshop next Monday the 7th of June and we are hoping to have all the weavers working in the week starting Monday 21st June. As the Emerald Hill premises 260 to 262 Park Street will not be ready to occupy for a few weeks, we will be commencing our workshop in the boardroom at the Ministry for the Arts. <laughs> in amongst the rubber plants. So. <laughs> and you can actually, if you're watching, oh, so it's not flipping over, is it? No. <laughs> if you'd seen it before, you would have seen us. Um, if you are happy to accept the position as weaver on a casual basis for the moment, I would appreciate it if you would reply in writing and then telephone me later next week to establish exactly the day on which we plan to start work. <laughs> so that was the very beginning. And I have to say, we all started working a bit more than two days a week pretty smartly <laughs> because there was so much to do. Um, so... Uh, because of this philosophy, what, what we did for the first few weeks was actually sample the work of a, a big range of Australian artists and not just go to, you know, the Coburn and the Olsen that had already been woven, but um, tremendous range, really. And it was very, it was very exciting. You really felt, you know, we were. By the time we moved in here, we were five people rattling around in two thousand square feet of space. It felt enormous. We had five small standing frames and one loom made by bioteners. And um, absolutely no sense about whether we could do it or not. We exactly, just... it was absolute chutzpah. You know, when I think about it. <laughs> but I think we were lucky because actually um, both Mari and Meryl were very strong people and and I think it was a lot down to their confidence really that we were at and and Sarah and I got carried along in jobs. <laughs> but for all that we were we just loved the work. We loved the work. We felt so happy. As Sarah said, you know, you felt like you were in heaven doing something that it always wanted to do. And we, and I think we got on really well. There was not a, a lot of dispute. It was always this sort of sense of adventure, really. Yeah. Do you want to add anything to that? Keep on. <laughs> okay. So we started work weaving um, the first tapestry with, oh, I should say, actually, before I say that, that one of the fantastic things that we had in our favour was that we had a very dynamic board of management who went out and sought commissions. And there were people who had a lot of influence. The Lenton Power was the, the chairman and he was the first director of the Victorian College of the Arts. We had Daryl Jackson, the architect. We had Betty Churchill. We had Dr. Eric Westbrook, and all these people really supported Sue Walker in her efforts to get commissions, which I think really sort of launched us. And of course, we had the backing of Sir Rupert Hamer and the financial backing too, in many ways, of Dame Elizabeth Murdoch, who made sure that there was always work for us to do over the years. You know, whenever anything lagged, she would commission something. 
and we were just so fortunate. Um, uh, we had early commissions from, oh, oh I won't get onto that yet. Um, what I wanted to say was we started our first tapestry, which was um, designed by Alan Beach Jones, and it was quite a simple work, but um, <laughs> we really made all our training mistakes on that. We were terribly ambitious, um, but somehow it worked out. But the most amazing thing was that this enormous commission from Canada from the Saskatchewan Centre for the Arts just fell in our lap. And what happened was that uh, the designer, Alan Weinstein, asked workshops from around the world to submit samples. And I think you and, and uh, Meryl would have worked the samples from us. And he said there was no competition, hands down, they were the best samples he'd seen. And I think it was because of that amazing sense of freedom, the amazing sense of colour, um, and I think colour is something I often talk about with this workshop, that we have the ability in this country to see colour and really, really interpret work, you know. In Although in those days, of course, we didn't have the extraordinary range of no. colour that we've got now. But I think but even you're there, confident with colour. That's right, that's right. So these were four enormous tapestries, you know, that landed in our life. We we barely commenced weaving our first tapestry. <laughs> then we all had to go off and, and weave this this Well, there was the interesting thing with the um, Alan Leach Jones, and I, I want to pay a tribute to Alan yes. Leach Jones too, because he was such an incredibly um, vital supporter of the workshop, and he gave me the most beautiful book. And I have a collection of most beautiful books and paintings and things from the artists that many of the artists I've worked with. But he really was such a great supporter, wasn't he? Yes. But that first tapestry we did, I mean, a lot of people might pick it up, but anyone who knows a little bit about weaving, we didn't learn how to make smooth curves till the second half. So you look at the bottom and what's supposed to be a nice curves. Sort of like <laughs> and then you look at the top of it. So at least by the time we got the Weinstein. Yes. Because <laughs> what, what happened was that Archie Brennan, who was then mentoring us, he visited us halfway through the Alan Leach Jones tapestry. <laughs> so the, the shapes in the bottom half are a bit jagged and this, the shapes in the top half were are uh, brilliantly smooth, you know, because he sorted out our uh, high and low turns, which we'd never learned to do before. But yes, it was it was a wonderful time, and uh, then following on from those commissions uh, that were from Canada, there were uh, there were a lot of um, commissions from state and federal governments, state galleries, the NGB and the NGA, the National Bank through George Mora commission he commissioned six tapestries for the uh, National Bank collection. And the other great advantage, which I speak about quite often to people, is that modernist architecture cries out for tapestry. And unfortunately, or fortunately, architecture has changed. And it's much harder to, to get a tapestry sitting comfortably in the sort of spaces that are designed today.